everybody. Uh, thank you guys for joining us here today for the uh, talk about uh, Jordan Harper's incredible novel, Everybody Knows. Um, just to clear up any confusion, I'm S.A. Cosby. Uh, <laughs> I'm the author of All the Sinners Bleed, uh, Raising Eight Tears in Black Dot Wasteland. And I am so excited to be here with my good friend and fellow author, Jordan Harper. I'd like to add uh, Edgar nominated novel all the sinners bleed <laughs> uh congratulations on that and uh, good to see you and thanks for thanks for joining me on on this that was did you see that little movie that played first that was cool yeah that was pretty cool i was I've like never man i need to... nobody's done that for my book but anyway <laughs> um, <laughs> i'm so excited to talk to you man it's good to see you um it's good to be able to talk about your book uh which i think is probably in my opinion the best crime novel of the year um <laughs> so um first things first i guess i'll ask you the question that we all hate um <laughs> where did uh where did the idea for uh everybody knows come from uh yeah you know look i i I've, I've worked in hollywood for i think 15 years now i'm currently joining everyone here from the warner brothers studio in burbank where i have uh, offices on the tv show i'm working on right now and i had uh you know so i spent a lot of time in hollywood and I've had a lot of frustrating and experiences there. And uh, I had just tried to bring James Elroy's LA Confidential to television. And we had sold it to a network and we'd actually shot a pilot that I'm very proud of, starred Walton Goggins, directed by Michael Denner. Uh, and I had worked out an entire season and in fact, an entire five season arc for uh, everybody in a, or for uh, LA Confidential. And, uh, you know, really gotten this like James Elroy energy in my head. And then when the TV show didn't happen, I felt a, a deep frustration with Hollywood and, and all, all of its machinations. But also I had this like epic L.A. crime energy in me with nowhere to go anymore because I wasn't going to be making the TV show. So I decided I was going to try and write something in the mode of these classic L.A. stories, uh, noirs like Chinatown. Uh, like L.A. Confidential, you know, like Chandler and all the the greats uh, of, who, who've contributed to this. But what I had noticed was there was nobody doing those kind of novels set right now. Um, there are other great L.A. crime novelists. There's, you know, Ivy Pakoda, Steph Chaw. Uh, there's a lot of people writing about Los Angeles, but there was nobody doing that big uh, L.A. epic noir set in the 21st century and i i decided i was going to try to be the person who who dragged this form into the new century and so that was the the real like kind of spark that got me to it and i've you know also always been fascinated with crimes and scandals around hollywood and you know the concept of um how truth and lies work in this environment and any environment having to do with power and i think that that's one of my my real interests in life. So I just kind of jammed those together and May's story came out of it. Yeah, and, and so as a reader, like just separating myself from, a, from being a writer and reading the book, I really did feel that in the pages of the book, that this is, I think I've told people more than once, it feels like the love child of LA Confidential in Chinatown, if, if that love child grew up and became a Hollywood executive. And so <laughs> that's definitely the energy uh, that the book brings, but also I want to ask you a question about setting and place. You know, you're originally from uh, Missouri, from the Ozarks, um, and uh, I'm originally from Virginia. So you you come from a sort of semi or rural background, but uh, like you said, you've been in Hollywood for over 15 years, and everybody knows seems very much a book of its time and place, separate from your previous novels, Last King California, She Ride Shotgun, which is also of instant classic so talk to us about how the setting of la not just the idea of the noir landscape but just la is this this place that is both a fantasy and a nightmare sort of wrapped into one yeah I, you know like you said I, I i started out writing about the ozarks which is where i'm from but i really didn't start writing crime fiction until i left the ozarks uh and i was living in new york city when i really started writing crime fiction but i never wrote I think I wrote one short story my entire career set in New York. Uh, when I was in New York, I was writing about the Ozarks. And then when I moved out here to LA, at first I was still trying to write about those same kind of people that I had grown up seeing in the Ozarks kind of, uh, you know, redneck criminal 
uh, and found that they existed here out in the Inland Empire. Uh, and she writes shotgun starts in a place called Fontana, which is also known as Fontucky because of the amount of rednecks who live there. And so it was very comfortable making that switch. Um, and then by the time I got to the last King of California, which was also set in the Inland Empire among those same types of people, I was now like 12 or 13 years out from ever having lived in the Ozarks or any place where I interacted with those people. And I was starting to feel like the well was dry. Um, but I think even though I'd started working on Everybody Knows before the pandemic, I really wrote it during the pandemic. So even though I was living in Los Angeles, I was separated from it because I was just living in my house the way we all were in those like early days of it. And so I was able to kind of reimagine it in my mind. And I think I basically took 15 years worth of Los Angeles and dumped it um, into this book. Uh, and, you know, look, like any place else, uh, Los Angeles is a place you can love and hate in equal measure. Um, there are things about this that I loved. And I tried to put that in the book. I really did try to get, you know, the, the diversity of this city um, that is often, in my mind, expressed through food, but also in just the different kinds of people and, and the, the, the textures and the climates and just the, the variety of not just people, but of architecture and, you know, that, that sharp thing where you're, you're you know, driving through a, a, a bunch of mansions and then you turn left and then you're in a homeless encampment. And, you know, I, I love that. And I, this is really something that's uh, talking about my next novel where I've kind of put forward the idea that LA is actually America concentrated and, and, and you know, everything that, that you would define America as is something you see in Los Angeles more than anywhere else. You know, we're, we're a country full of cars, find more cars, more traffic, more roads than anywhere. This is where we invented the freeway, you know, and um, fame and money and real estate and crime and corruption and ambition and celebrity, all of these things um, all, all kind of are come to their like peak here in Los Angeles. Uh, again, I'm quoting from my, my new book when I say uh, Los Angeles is America with its back up against the wall because it's always go west, young young man, go west, young man. Well, here we are. This is west. There's nothing but ocean. <laughs> so now it's just America with its back against the wall. And, and I, I find it such a fascinating place to write about because of that, because um, I think, you know, you might have a different take and, and I'd love to talk about it. But, you know, I think one of the things about what we do, the crime fiction we write is... It, it's dramatic stories where people are capable of doing anything, you know, and you can tell these very human stories, but with this kind of crackling electric shell uh, of violence and brutality and power grabs and lies and all of that. And that's the appeal of the genre to me. And I think that's one of the reasons why LA is one of the absolute epicenters of crime and noir in the world is because of those elements. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, one time uh, last year, I visited LA, and you were so kind to uh, take me on a little drive around uh, around the city when I was out there promoting my book. And the thing that struck me about Los Angeles, as as again a, a kid from back back east from the south, is Los Angeles has this sort of feeling of it, like you were saying that anything can happen. There's this undertow in LA where you can walk out your door, you can go down the street to like. Uh, a place that only sells, you know, mashed lemonade and and uh, and vegan salads, and then you could turn the corner and you could find yourself surrounded by Armenian bikers. And so I think there's this <laughs> this sense <laughs> that's a little in joke, but anyway, <laughs> but there's a sense that anything, both good and bad, is possible in LA. Let me ask you a question: You've been out there, like you said, almost fifteen, more, a little more than fifteen years. Do you still feel like you're the country kid from back east or do you feel like no I've, I've become a los angelino and so in the way that robert craze is uh has his la and michael conley has his la and as you mentioned elroy who's a big influence on a lot of us has his la so do you feel like yes i'm jordan harper from the ozarks but also i'm jordan harper who is a los angelino and this is my point of view and i do you feel like you know you've earned the right to write about it well, you know, I think that's it. those are two different answers where I would say, I think 15 years in, I have earned the right to to write about it. And I hopefully have, have done it well. And, and people seem to think that I get it right. But I do think I write from an outsider's point of view. Uh, I'm an embedded outsider at this point. But like I, 
I think I see it in a different way than like, certainly Elroy, who, who who grew up here and it's just baked into him. And but, you know, I was talking to uh, I was speaking to a class earlier this week, uh, virtually on Zoom uh, with our friend Eli Craner, uh, who teaches a, a writing class in Arkansas. And I was telling them this. I never thought of before, but I think even when I was writing about the Ozarks, I was writing about it from an outsider's point of view, uh, specifically since I didn't even really start writing about it until I left. And I think that I've always been a person who writes from a remove, uh, which is why I think, um, you know, May and people like that are more self-aware than maybe characters are in other people's books. I think it's because there's always that kind of step back, that like narrator who is is seeing this not from the baked and embedded world of Los Angeles, but from a different place. So I do feel like I write from an educated outsider's point of view. I do think of myself as a Angelino now, but it, it is, um, it's an adopted home and I think it will always be an adopted home. You mentioned May. May, May Pruitt is the main character of Everybody Knows. Um, she is a uh, quote unquote black bag publicist who keeps the bad news in, doesn't, doesn't put the good news out. And the thing I, that struck me about May is she is an incredibly complex and vibrant character, a female character where uh, and then some people will, will have concerns about a man writing a woman or a female character. But what I thought you did so well with, with May is that she's not like a man masquerading as a, as a female character. She is a woman in this industry, a woman who is working in the entertainment industry, and she observes it from a, a female perspective. And one thing that stood out to me, there's a line that you wrote in the book, and I quote it to a lot of people. People like to talk about actresses being crazy. But nobody talks about how they got that way. And and when you see that through May's point of view, it really strikes you that, yes, this is a woman working in entertainment who has a very unique perspective. So talk about May a little bit about where she came from and, and why you decided to use her as the tip of your spear in the <laughs> book. Uh, yeah, you know, I... I, I like I said, I really came around to the idea of writing about a, a black bag publicist uh, or a crisis manager pretty early on in the process. And I don't like to attribute a lot of things to just like the stars or fate or whatever. But there was never a moment when I thought about May being a man. It was just not the idea for the book. It was May was going to be a woman who who had to deal with those problems on top of the problems of just being in Hollywood and. You know, I, I never set out to do this. It was never a conscious thing, but um, I have to acknowledge it by this point. Every novel I've written has had both a male and a female point of view character in it. Um, she Rides Shotgun has Nate and Polly. Last King of California has, uh, you know, a male and a female protagonist. The book I'm right, working on now has both. Um, and everybody knows has both. And I just think that I am interested partially in, in bringing crime fiction into the 21st century. And not that there, there are so many women who write crime fiction, I'm not like trying to do anything that they're not doing, but I think specifically having a male perspective, hard-boiled crime writer who is also trying to write a woman's perspective simultaneously is something that I never set out to do, but it's clearly part of what I'm interested in doing. And so I really do, you know, try and take that seriously. And, you know, my, my partner, Megan, is also a TV writer and I have a lot of friends who are women in Hollywood. And, and so I have tried my best to listen to them and take their problems seriously. Um, and I hope that comes through when I write May. And I think, you know, the line about everybody talks about how eight cra crazy actresses are, they don't ask how they got that way. That's just based on my own personal experience and my own frustrations I've had with actresses in, in, in situations like that where, you know, they won't do something that we need them to do to make a scene and, and then kind of walking it back and going, you know, can I imagine a situation where something like this happened and it was bad? Can I imagine a situation where this is a, a woman who is asked to look perfect at all times and like, and what that does to people, but also just, you know, I've talked to, I've talked to A-list actresses, people whose names, you know, who have told me, oh yeah, my agent sent me on a meeting with Harvey Weinstein at, in a hotel lobby and just said, well, don't leave the room with them. And that was the amount of protection they were willing to give the, these actresses. And that's where the title comes from. Obviously, it's a Leonard Cohen song reference that everybody knows, but it's true. Everybody knows. Like when Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. went down, it was not a lot of people in Hollywood shocked, gasping. I mean, you can Google Courtney Love, Google Courtney Love Harvey Weinstein and watch the YouTube clip where she just completely calls him out. And it's 
10 years maybe before he went down and she just says, what's my advice for an actress in Hollywood? Don't go to a meeting with Harvey Weinstein. Um, yeah. And everybody knew and they, they kept sending their actresses into these meetings with them. And so, you know, again, I think that Hollywood is, is an essentially immoral place that we shouldn't, I shouldn't be working here. I think it's wrong. Um, <laughs> but I think as hard as it is for me, I, I recognize that it's much, much harder for other people. And I think that letting May be a person who participated in that and, and, and had kind of walled herself off from her own feelings about what she was doing and then coming to grips with them is very much uh, the story that I'm telling about myself. I just am still trying to get out of Hollywood, you know, in a way that, well, you know, not to spoil anything. Um, but um, yeah, I think that I, I, I am comfortable writing women characters and giving them my problems and then trying to think about how it's different for a woman than for me. And uh, hopefully I do a good job. Yeah, I think you did an excellent job. Uh, it was really, me is one of these characters for me, she's not the hero, but she's the protagonist. And I mm. thought you did a really good job of showing that as opposed to somebody like Chris Tamboro, who's a, a supporting character, May's former on again, off again lover, a uh, former uh, 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 LA County Sheriff who, also is struggling with sort of this moral quandary that he finds himself in, in now, that he's sort of the muscle for these terrible people that run Hollywood, for the beast. Um, talk a little bit about the concept of the beast in the book and, and what that entails uh, when we're talking about the Hollywood uh, machinery. Yeah, the, the beast is is a concept that, that May crystallizes for herself. And it's 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 trying for her to put a name to something that doesn't have a name which is the amalgamation of private security forces, lawyers, publicists, black bag publicists, and all the other systems that exist to basically protect and perpetuate power in Los Angeles. Um, and it, obviously beasts exist everywhere. And it is, um, it's about how there's not a meeting that all these people go to, you know? And that's my belief about most conspiracies is Conspiracies don't usually exist in the way people imagine them, which is a smoky, dark room where everybody sits down and talks about every single illegal thing they're going to do. And then they all shake hands and, <laughs> you know, uh, carpool to the grassy knoll. Like, I don't think that's what it is, I think. But I think the reason we're so fascinated with conspiracy stories is things happen. It might as well be a conspiracy. And I think that because the system is set up to just make you make decisions that you are going to make because of just who you are and why you're in that room. And, and the beast exists to make sure that nobody ever has to like form a huge conspiracy and make a big plan because everybody's just going to do what they're going to do. Like the press is manipulated on a daily basis by, uh, by crisis managers. And it's because crisis managers know how reporters do their job and they feed into that. They don't have to call a reporter and go, we're going to smear this lady, so here's some false news about her. They don't have to do that. They just have to call and say the, the false thing. And the reporter will print it and say, um, that like the reporters will print things they know aren't true. They will mm -hmm. print quotes from politicians that they know aren't true, but they feel like they have to report it because a politician said it. And therefore, it's new, newsworthy and they can do whatever they do, you know, unproven allegations, blah, blah, blah. But the point is they're willing to print things that they know aren't true. And so crisis managers know that and they capitalize on it. And so I just think like the beast is all of these unspoken, unsaid power relationships that exist just to perpetuate power. And, and that most systems, whether or not we like to admit it, that's their first function. That's the first function of the police. Um, is to maintain order and maintain the power structure that we have and then solving crimes, blah, blah, blah. That's all incidental. That's secondary. That's, that's just cleanup work. But, um, and that's true of, of, of a lot of different institutions. And, and that is May's name for it is the beast. So just in case there are folks watching who haven't read the book, um, which is like, you, you should get on that immediately. Uh, give us a little quick overview of the basic plot of everybody knows and talk a little bit about, about May and Chris and, and uh, what's what's going on in sunny LA. Um, it, so, so like I said, May is a black bag publicist. She is, as you said, it's a length of, she doesn't get the good news out. She keeps the bad news in. And she works at this firm that does this on a lot of different levels for powerful politicians, 
for you know companies trying to shut down unions and strikes. Um, and she is usually a person who deals with celebrities. And um, she is brought in very early uh, to the possibility that there might be a little extra work that could make her some illegal money. And she's very interested in finding out what this is, but before she can, there is a murder that uh, affects somebody that she's very close to. And she decides that this murder wasn't the carjacking gone wrong that it appears to be, that in fact, somebody was doing this to keep the lid on secrets that were threatening to get out. And against her best judgment, and because she does her job, and she's very good at what she does, and she is thrilled by living this Hollywood lifestyle, she also is morally compromised by it. And that leads her to want to investigate this crime. And at the same time, we meet her ex-boyfriend, uh, Chris Tamburo, uh, who's named after CT, who's currently on the show The Traders, if you watch that. Um, and uh, he is an ex-LAPD sheriff, or ex-LA Sheriff's Department uh, guy, and a corrupt cop. He's very open about the fact that he was a corrupt cop. He was using drugs. He was stealing guns, stealing drugs, making money, and got caught, but didn't get busted because the beasts kind of said, oh, here's a guy, if we save him from this prosecution, then here's a guy we can use to solve problems for us. And so he is now a quote unquote investigator for a sleazy attorney uh, and is the kind of guy who will like go break the nose of a blackmail schemer uh, or, you know, do what he has to do. He's kind of like, um, if, uh, if May is like the velvet glove, he's the iron fist, uh, but they both mm -hmm. work for the beast, you know, and for different reasons that, you know, would require some spoilers. He is also starts investigating this, this murder uh, from a different angle. And, you know, I don't think it's going to surprise anyone that eventually these two ex-lovers are going to come together on this investigation and realize that what they have discovered is so dark that they can't kind of hide from the immorality of what they do any longer. And they have to make a decision about what kind of person uh, he's going to be, you know? And um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, and then it goes and it just goes deeper and deeper and darker and darker and more crimes are uncovered. And, and I, you know, I riff on a lot of true crimes uh, that have kind of stained Hollywood from the beginning, and uh, it just uh, kind of heads into crazier territory until, uh, you know, they 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 come face to face with the beast, more or less. I wanted to ask you a question, veering a little bit away from the, the plot and stuff, but some technical stuff. For those that don't know, you used to write an, uh, a, a, a newsletter called Welcome to the Hammer Party, which is basically your ideas and theories about writing and i say this to a lot of people and i'll, I'll say to you uh there are very few writers that are thinking about writing the way you do and i wanted to say ask you a question technically with the structure of of everybody knows like you said you have two points of view may and chris um and they sort of commingle and separate as the book goes on but also you do something i thought was very interesting your omniscient narrator voice is very assured and it's not just talking about stuff through May's point of view, but you really do use that voice to dissect LA. And and, and the thing that struck stuck with me in a technical term is everybody and everybody knows eats at these very LA restaurants where you're drinking a mashta tea, which looks like green baby doo doo, or you're uh, <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> or you're at a, a salad bar that's a salad bar, but hey, somebody sells coke in the bathroom. And so I guess when I'm like the question I have is technically, do you does that come from maybe your your uh, career as a screenwriter, as a showrunner, that you're able to sort of almost give like shot directions through the, your omniscient narrator? And if you could speak a little bit about your how your uh, day job influences your uh, novel writing. I, yeah, no, I think that's absolutely correct. I think that, that now that I've been a TV writer for uh, 14 years or whatever it's been, um, it's, it's why I've switched almost totally uh, present tense in my writing. It's why I tend to go for these kind of visceral moments because I, I am used to writing that way for, for scripts. And it's a very engaging way uh, of writing when you do it right. You know, a lot of screenplays aren't fun to write. And I think that's where my fiction writing has actually affected my script writing is I try very hard to make my scripts readable so that I'm really reaching a place where my prose and my 
scripts are kind of coming together in a way and, and they're not that far apart anymore. Obviously with novels, there are things you can't do in a script. You can go inside people's heads. You can really lay out thoughts. You can, you can make observations that are hard to make in, in a script, but I just find, yeah, I haven't written anything first person in a long time other than uh, my savage year, that short story, which is a very different project because I do like kind of that camera eye on, on people. And so screenwriting again it's it's a it's a visceral it's a right now kind of feeling to read that first person or that third person present tense um and so i definitely kind of capitalize on that especially for everybody knows where there is the hollywood angle to it i think that um having those that feeling of almost reading a screenplay at times is actually really effective in that way and and you know it, it's all about getting people locked in and i think that uh, I think that first person works in a good way to lock people in into the story because it feels like it's happening right now. And I think that kind of helps add to the propulsiveness, which is always one of my big goals is, uh, you know, keep the train running as fast as I can. Um, so, yeah, I think absolutely. It, it really is um, the melding of the two things that I, I work on coming together. Yeah, your your uh, your narrative propulsion is uh something that I aspire to. I, I read She Rides Shotgun and I remember describing it to someone. It's a shark that just keeps moving forward all, all the time, never takes a step back. And and I've seen that with Last King and also with Everybody Knows. And then also with little snippets that you've allowed me to see of the next book. So <laughs> there's definitely that. I, I have two more questions I want to ask you and then we're going to start taking uh, some of the, the pre-submitted questions. So one, you and I have talked a lot over the years about writing, about writing theory uh, and different styles. And I think what always fascinates me is that I come from, I come to writing with a very <laughs> Old Testament perspective that good is good and bad is bad. And sometimes bad wins, but sometimes good is able to get in there and and, and knock a couple of their teeth back. You have a, a perspective that I wouldn't call nihilism, but I think it's, I call it pessimistic optimism. <laughs> And maybe you could talk about your perspective and your sort of theory about writing, how it affects your your novels. Yeah, you know, I I am a noir writer. At the end of the day, I have I have a a dark view of of the American project, and and that comes from my politics, which are not what everybody's politics are. I'm, I'm uh, a pretty fierce critic of what's going on, and I think what separates me from from a nihilist or a more right-wing writer like James Elroy who I, again I love his work but there's a, some really basic um divides in in how we see the world is um I really do believe that there's a better world possible than the one we live in which I think separates me from a lot of pure noir writers I think a lot of pure noir which came out of 20th century the American century was an idea that this is the way things are and therefore it's the way things have to be. And I, I believe that we have gotten ourselves into the pickle and we can get ourselves back out, but we have to acknowledge that and we have to, um, we have to fight and we have to, to acknowledge our participation in immoral systems, which I try to do without feeling like a hypocrite. Um, and I write about, my characters are not sociopaths. I don't write that kind of noir where, where the, it's just sociopathic and those, those, that stuff can be so much fun to read. I write about people who are doing bad things and kind of know they're doing a bad thing and, and they feel sort of helpless. Uh, a, a metaphor that maybe only makes sense to me um, is the concept. You ever like, this is less of a thing now, but back in the day when you needed your car in the, the keys in the ignition to start the car and, and you've locked the car door and you get out of the car and you slam the door shut. And as it's closing, you just, you may, maybe your hand's still on the door, but you're just closing it and you see the keys inside the car and your hand's still mm -hmm. on the door and you're still shutting it. And you just think, I'm locking the keys in the car slam. And then it's mm -hmm. done. And I just think a lot of life is like that. A lot of times you see mm -hmm. yourself, you see the hand on the car door, you see the keys in there, and <laughs> but you're just slamming <laughs> the door shut. And you feel totally helpless against it. And that's how I feel about free will a lot of the time is, you know, I think, Individual free will is a very overrated thing. Um, as I, I <laughs> say in The Last King of California, you know, life grabs you in its jaws like a bear and the screaming and flailing you do is what we call free will. You know, like, yeah. yes, you have a choice, but you're being eaten by a bear. Um, 
And so, <laughs> but I really, you know, I think that is what separates me from a lot of other people who write in the tone and mode and style that I do is that I, I fully believe in the potential to make things better, but we just have to admit first that that change is possible and it's not going to be done in increments and it's not going to be done, you know, uh, by people that we look at and we know aren't going to do it. Like it's, it's got to come from someplace else and it's got to come from the bottom to the top is, is, you know, really my belief. That's so. an interesting metaphor. I like that metaphor because it also, if you take it one step further, you can, you can kind of decide what kind of person you are. Are you the kind of person that calls a locksmith to open your car door? Or are you the kind of person that breaks the window? Breaks the and window. Then, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so that's interesting. One last question I'm going to ask, then I'm going to go to some of the pre uh, submitted question. So again, we, again, we've talked a lot with, you know, I make no secret we're friends and we've talked a lot about writing and writing theory. And I notice that the violence in your books always feels very matter of fact. Like when I write violence, a lot of times I try to make it feel epic. Like it is all again, old West, old Testament. You know, a lot of times the violence in my book is sort of a standoff or, or what have you. But I remember specifically, there's a scene in Shira shotgun where the protagonist Nate is trying to get information from somebody and he knocks over a, uh, a outdoor grill, a little top grill. And then he grabs the person he's trying to get information from and he presses them on the, their naked back on the coals. And that scene always struck me because there's not a lot of preamble to it. You know, there's not a lot of posturing and threats and, and all that stuff that you might see in a, a Clint Eastwood movie. So speak a little bit about how you use violence because it's the same feeling and everybody knows that your violence is very judicious but also it seems to just come out of nowhere and that, i mean that's a compliment that's not an insult and i wonder if you could just talk about how you use violence in your writing yeah no i think that you know i think that violence is, is, is one of my main areas of interest uh for good or ill um there's a, a script i wrote years ago a couple of years ago called rat kings which was a crime drama that i was going to do with the director Karn Kusama, and unfortunately, we weren't able to um, sell it. But uh, I had a, a slug line in there that has sort of become one of my credos, uh, which I put in the script right after the first act of somebody being shot in the script, which is, um, we I, we don't do action, we do violence, and and that is sort of the watchword I use in in everything I do is that I want violence to be short and brief and brutal, and I want there to be snaps and crunches and I want all those Anglo-Saxon hard consonant words and I want it to be shocking. I do. I, and I think that to me, I've always said this, I say it in TV rooms and I say it in books. I think that a sawed off shotgun is more dramatic than a machine gun. A uh, six shooter is more dramatic than a sawed off shotgun. A baseball bat is more dramatic than any of those. The, the smaller and more intimate you can make violence, the more effective it is. Uh, it's sort of the inverse of that Stalin quote about, you know, uh, one death is a tragedy and a, a million deaths is a statistic. I think, I think mm -hmm. all due respect to everybody involved, a lot of great creative people. That's why I don't respond to the John Wick films, um, because he kills a, 150 people. Who cares? Um, I want to see a movie where one guy is trying to kill one other guy. Um, and I also, you know, I, I try... And I, because again, I think, you know, this is a good place where we're talking about the differences with, 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 with you and I is, I agree that like, you have that kind of Old Testament, like, that the violence can rain down and all the sinners bleed, like, it's like right there, right? Like, you're, you know, not that <laughs> violence can't happen to good people, it obviously does, but like, that there's that element of it. And I, I try and always remove the moral component of violence. I always try, and I mean that in both directions, I, I want the you know sometimes good guys get shot sometimes bad guys get shot mm -hmm. and 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 you can't control that in the worlds that i that, that i write about it it's it's gonna you know it's gonna happen and and the violence is you know so much a part of what we are and what we what we are as creatures as animals as humans what we repress how violence comes out in different forms is something that's so interesting to me things that you know there's a line and everybody knows that um you know, the biggest trick that people get to play and who are in control is what we call violence and what we don't call violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a big believer that violence is violence is violence, it, that, that, that a, a badge doesn't make a bullet hurt less. A, you know, a, uh, um, 
a uh, you know that that any kind of formal authority doesn't remove the violence from what is being done, and that goes in both directions. That violence done to a symbol of authority is 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 just the same as violence done in reverse. Uh, I know not everybody feels right. that way, and that's okay. But like, <laughs> um, but that's just no. How I think I we am. both agree. No, oh, I know yeah, we. I think yeah. we both agree on. We both agree on that. And I think the one thing that we both do that I like is that the violence in our books has consequences. Yes. You know, when people get hurt in your books and my books, three chapters later, they're still hurt. They're still lingering with those effects as opposed to, you know, an 80s action movie where somebody takes 16 shots to the shoulder and they keep and they keep going. So I do I do appreciate it. And I like those nuances, those difference, differences that you were talking about. I think that's what makes writing unique and interesting. But anyway, Oh, no, for let's sure. Get... <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, go now. Finish your thought. Oh no, I was like, you know, I do think it, it, it's it's an interesting thing because, uh, you know, like all the sinners bleed, and 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 everybody knows are two totally different worlds, but like they kind of in a weird way wind up in the same place. Um, yeah. If you think about those last chapters, it's just we we drive very different roads to get there, but it's about the same. It's about the same story, I would actually say. Yeah, it's just yeah, that's totally interesting. Said that because I think, I think it's and not to make it about my book but i think it is interesting that titus and may are polar opposites in many ways but they're also driven to find the truth yeah they have different motivations but the the once they get on that road they don't take their foot off the gas or as my mom would say it's the uh same church just different pews there you <laughs> go i like that. <laughs> um got a couple questions here i think we've already answered a few so i'll skip those uh i know the answer to this but i want to hear you say it do you start your stories with an outline? And that was submitted by Tammy Evans. Uh, yes, I am a big believer in outlining. I I think it comes from being in television where we have to outline. It's a it's a part of the gig here in TV. Um, and so I, I find it very comforting. I, I like to do a, a, a very strict, uh, well, like I, I do a card per chapter, you know, and, and I feel like when I know what the story is, it's good to go when I start writing. I will say, though, I am currently in like a second draft of the new book, and I have been throwing out a lot of the outline as I've been rewriting. Um, so you have to stay loose. You have to do what works um, all the time. And I do multiple, multiple drafts. But I always like I like to to build the skeleton and then drape the meat over it is always how I look at it. Um, I know other people do the other way. I don't know how you're not thinking about what happens down the line when you write. I just don't know how you would do it. I, I've kind of thought about maybe trying to do one book where I, I don't outline, but not the next one, not the next one. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, 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 I don't outline per se. I do like a big synopsis, but yeah, I'm not a, I, I don't fly by the seat of my pants. So no offense to pantsers everywhere, oh. but that doesn't work for me. Um, another question here. And I, I'm interested to see what the answer is. I think I know, but uh, of all the characters you've written in short stories and novels, do you have a favorite? Wow. Um, that was from Nikki Dolson. Hey, Nikki. Um, I mean, if I had to pick one, I would probably pick Polly, uh, from She Rides Shotgun. Um, just I, I, I think weirdly, Polly is probably the character who's the most like me in anything I've written. Um, and uh, I just think that like I had a, a like a kind of, you know, picture of 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 somebody I've never seen written before that I think she encapsulates and i i just uh yeah i think i think polly from she right shotgun Ooh. uh i thought it was somebody else though that i was that was wrong oh uh, we, we can talk about that i would say yeah i thought it was gonna be uh the, the guy uh is it scuds the guy oh, that, scubby uh, scubby yeah <laughs> scubby is is my favorite character to keep putting in things but if you notice like scubby is a is a is a meth head and like a, but a kind of like a lovable loser who's appeared in, in a couple of short stories. He's in She Rides Shotgun. He's in uh, Last King of California. Uh, the thing about Scubby is he first of all he's named by uh, after a guy I lived next to in college, uh, and, and um, who brewed his own beer and owned pit bulls and like was just like he didn't last long in college. To be totally honest, um, I'm so but, surprised. Uh, <laughs> I do love Scubby. I, I love, I love, but I kind of love beating the hell out of him. Honestly, is <laughs> is what happens when you read what happens to Scubby in, in the different stories, particularly in um, 
uh, Sunday Morning Coming Down, which is a, a sort of an obscure short story of mine, but it's my Christmas story. Uh, and and Scubby gets it bad in that one. <laughs> he gets it pretty bad, and she rides shotgun, and he gets it really bad in the last. Yeah, he's in my punching bag, so I really do like him. But he 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 survives. That's the thing about I like about Scubby. He survives. <laughs> yes. Um, here's another question from uh Ali Ahart, uh, and they wanted to know what was the inspiration for the art piece scene, and I I don't know if we can talk about that without giving spoilers, but there's a scene, and everybody knows where someone's telling someone a story about how a rich person mm. uh, defaced the piece of art that they own. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Well, I will talk about the inspiration, which is which is a very real piece of inspiration. And, and this is, I guess, a slight spoiler about what direction uh, everybody knows goes in. But there is a story about Jeffrey Epstein uh, that in his uh, New York apartment, which to call it an apartment is like it was in an entire building, I believe. Uh, in, in New York City, uh, he had a taxidermy dog in his lobby, uh, like the entranceway, and, and that everyone who saw it um, was completely unnerved and like, because it was like, why would you have a taxidermy dog just sitting there? It's like a dead dog. That, like People would walk into his mm -hmm. house and see a dead dog, and everybody talked about how they found it very unnerving and weird. Uh, and so I was trying to to get that effect from this character without just ripping off the the Epstein story. And so I thought mm -hmm. about what else would make people just kind of take in somebody's wealth and understand how much money they had and therefore how much anything else mattered to them. And I came up with this with the art uh, story. And it's a powerful scene. It really it really encapsulates who the villain, what kind of people the villains are and what they're willing to do. I think that was really such a brilliant scene. Uh, uh, this is an interesting question. Do you think you could have written Everybody Knows if you didn't live in L.A.? No. Um, and yeah, yeah. I'm sorry yeah, to I, cut I, you I off there. Oh, no, 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 you're fine. I thought that's the, I mean, that's the, the right answer. I mean, I, I don't think you could have. I think it's a unique perspective on Los Angeles. It's, uh, it's a book that has uh, inspired me to maybe step out and set a book in L.A., uh, an earlier version of L.A. But yeah, I think that's a definitely... The way you wrote it, you have to live there to write in that way, and that, and then to add that nuance and talk about the complexities of of the city, you have to have lived there as opposed to just googling and pulling up Google Maps. Um, I, I also just think, like, like real specifically, like my experience in Hollywood made it. Um, I don't think you could fake a lot of what I know about living in Hollywood, and uh, it, you know, it's fifteen years worth of stories. A lot of those stories are true in a different form, you know. Right. Uh, let's see. We got a couple more good questions here. Um, oh, oh, this is a good question. How does how do you discover material to write about? Uh, what inspires some of this stuff? I know you've talked to me in the past that you uh you follow like uh the uh the crime reports in L.A. and and uh and stuff like that. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, look, I, you know, the, the most obvious thing is I read the LA Times and and I uh, <laughs> I have a, a there's a a website and a program called Rome Research, which is R O A M Research, which allows you to keep track of stories or keep track of information in, in a cross-referenced way that I I copy and paste all these stories into that. I you know, I never uh, I, I never try and do research if I can help it. I like to just write mm -hmm. about what I'm interested in and I'm interested in all this stuff. So it makes it way easier for me um, that I'm always looking for, you know, the what's the big crime stories in LA? What are going on in other cities that I could adapt for this? What are the, you know, I'm always reading nonfiction books about conspiracies and, and power structures and, you know, police and policing and private policing firms and, and all that. And so I just keep running files and and tabs and I you know I have 50 tabs open on my browser and most of them are about like how the uh coroner's office here in LA uh will um classify people who've died in in the men's central jail here as natural causes even though their bodies are covered in bruises that's something for the new book mm. but um you know mm. and and I, but that's just something I would do whether or not I was writing this book I would want to read that story cuz this is what I'm interested in is the specific application of power uh, in Los Angeles and, and in America and then in the world. Um, so I just, I write about what I'm interested in. And I really think 
that you know, I ran into something in this new book where I gave a character a job that I found out I wasn't really interested in the uh, the technical <laughs> details of, uh, and got very bored and just made a decision of, um, okay, we're just not going to do a lot of scenes about that because I just I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go do a bunch of research about something I'm not interested. It's just uh, uh, spoiler free. We're just not going to be in court a lot, you know, like um, to, to to kind of get to it, but like. Because I just I, 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 I can't more... feel like work. Yeah, go ahead, go for it. Oh, uh, because I got a couple more questions here. Um, uh, is a good question. Uh, somebody want to know what authors do you read, or and I guess I'll extrapolate that. What authors do you think inspired you? I know Elroy is a big ex, uh, inspiration, and that comes from Jennifer, Jennifer McMillan. Uh, I know Elroy is a big ins inspiration, but uh, yeah, talk about some of your your uh, your uh, ins ins inspiration as people and books that influenced you. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think that uh, obviously I know you and I share Cormac McCarthy. Um, you know, that's a big one for me. Megan Abbott is a huge influence for me. I, I just think that, you know, present company excluded, she is the best person writing crime fiction right now. Um, I I love, although it's a love-hate thing, but I love some of the best books of David Peace, who I think is a very mm -hmm. underrated author. He wrote the Red Riding trilogy. Um, and uh, he kind of like uh, the Red Riding trilogy is is like the darkest, nastiest, meanest, most complicated, most convoluted, like epic noir that you can ever find. And I think two of the books are great and two of them are very hard to read um, because he's also very mm -hmm. experimental in a way that I find interesting. But sometimes experiments fail. Um, so there's yeah. a lot of David Peace. Um, and then, you know, I think that, again, I think you and I share this. I grew up on Stephen King, and I can't let go of that as as a major inspiration for me. Um, Hunter S. Thompson was when I was in high school and college. I thought I wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson, um, and uh, it took me getting a job in journalism and realizing that I just wanted to make stuff up. So I saved the world <laughs> like a shattered glass story about a music journalist who 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 made a bunch of stuff up by getting out of the industry because um, I just wanted to tell the stories I wanted to tell. I'm not. I'm not I've said this, I think, probably to you before, but realism is a tool. It's not a goal for me. I, I, I want real feeling details that bring people into the world. That's all I want. I don't need it to be accurate. I don't need it to be true. Like I don't need it to be factual. I just want to tell the story. So, yeah, I mean, if you want, if you want hyper realism, that's why they make documentaries. Don't read fiction books. Exactly. Um, so, a couple more questions, and then uh. uh I wanted to ask one last thing before we before we wrap up here. So our friend Jen jo Johans, who's a great film uh, uh, critic, film historian, uh, she said, "You just finished a draft of your follow up novel. Please tell us a little bit about it. So if you could maybe give us a little sneak peek into what's coming up next." Yeah. Um. Hi, Jen. Um. I. It, it is. It is. I don't like calling it a sequel to Everybody Knows um, because Chris and May are not the protagonists of it. There's a whole new set of protagonists, but is absolutely set in the world and aftermath of Everybody Knows. And it has um, three protagonists, um, one of whom is a defense attorney, one of whom is a private concierge, which is a fascinating business, very close to, to um, the beast, but it's like the pleasure principle of the beast. It's mm -hmm. the people who get you the things that you want. Um, and then there's like a, a night crawler, but he's a modern day night crawler, uh, which means he's not selling stuff to news stations because that stuff's very cheap now because everybody has a phone mm -hmm. in their pocket right. so they can sell footage. But he live streams himself as he drives through bad neighborhoods and he follows up on crimes and he, you know, kind of has a social media following as he is driving through South Central looking for murder victims to to like kind of take pictures of. And so it's a it's a new take on a night crawler. And, and uh, they both, they all three find themselves locked into a, a case that is very, um, uh, crazy. Uh, it's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say much more. I will say it. It's, um, if you, if you thought that everybody knows was a little over the top, then I have really bad news for you. Um, <laughs> before we, uh, before we wrap up, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about, um, the short story you mentioned earlier. My Savage Year. Uh, I read it. Uh, we we're both in uh, a noir issue of uh, Southwest Review. And I told somebody, that story is so good. I asked the editor to pull my story. 
because I didn't feel like it was of the equal caliber of what oh, you had written. Man. But um, talk about my savage year a little bit. I know it's very personal story for you. If you could just give people a little quick overview, because in my opinion, it's one of the best, not even crime fiction short stories. It's one of the best short stories I've read in a decade. So just uh, talk about that a little bit. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that. You, I'm really glad you didn't pull your story. This is really good. But uh, but but my savage year is something I've literally been working on for over a decade in different forms. Um, when I was a senior in high school, the story begins. Uh, my biology teacher murdered his family and got away with it. Um, and that is the impetus for this story. It is very fictionalized from a true thing that happened in my hometown. But there's a lot of real stuff in it, and I think. Uh, you know, I've tried to write it as a novel. I tried to sell it as a TV show. And then uh, when our friend Bill Boyle asked for us to contribute uh, to the thing, along with Nikki Dolson, who I know is here, hey, Nikki. Um, and uh, I just, I took it as an opportunity to get this thing out of my skull. And uh, so I really just worked on it. It's what I was writing for the strike uh, because I was having a hard time working on the novel uh, while the WGA was on strike. Um, and... I just kind of poured everything I could into it to get it just dense. And there's a lot of really personal stuff about myself in there. There's a lot of lies in it too. And I think that's what really interests me. It's uh, if, if people listening haven't seen it, like Sean said, it's at the Southwest Review. You just Google my name and the, and the phrase my, or just Google my savage year and it will come up. And uh, I, thanks for asking. I'm, I'm, I'm intensely proud of it. I'm as proud of it as anything I've ever written, I think. You should be. It's uh, I was in uh, I was in Alabama over the weekend in Birmingham at a, a small mystery conference, and uh, all the writers that I knew that were there were talking about how they're going to be uh, people going to be teaching that story nice. in high schools for decades to come. It's a phenomenal piece of work. Um, but before we wrap up, we'll turn back over to uh, everybody knows the thing that I took from it when I read the first draft and also the final version is, is to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong. But to me, some Shiva Shotgun was sort of your interpretation, your articulation of the people you grew up with in the Ozarks, those that have moved to California, sort of that same sort of, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but that same sort of dirty white boy, you know, Stephen Hunter sort of world that exists, you know, and I grew up, you know, we both grew up in areas where that is very real and very prevalent, you know, I know, uh, in my hometown, there's a couple people have gone missing who probably ended up in uh, bait as bait for crab pots, and so it felt like you were you were really trying to articulate that. But for me, everybody knows. I don't say you closed that door, but it definitely felt like you were shifting your focus and your interest into what is your you know your current uh, zeitgeist. And so I was wondering, I guess the question I want to ask is, do you think you'll ever return to that world? You know, the world of the McCluskey brothers and the Inland Empire and and uh and uh guys that we knew in high school who knew where to get the good weed and, and so <laughs> I don't know if you'd ever return to that world. I I think I would like to. I think that my sense is that I almost have a trilogy with She Rides Shotgun and Last King of California. Um and I think that I would like to do one more book. I think that you know I'm gonna do this LA book. I have a, an idea for a novel after that that in my head is set in Florida, but it would mean me moving to Florida for a while to do it. Um, but could also maybe be this story. Um, but I do think I'd like to do it one more time, but I just really had to like, I'll have to get back into it. I'll have to get it back under my skin. You know what I mean? Cause it's just, mm -hmm. I've lived a Hollywood lifestyle for uh, like 15 years now, which makes it sound like I drive a Corvette. I don't, I drive a Hyundai Sonata, <laughs> but like, um, um but he's like, a very sensible car. So it's a very sensible <laughs> car. Um, but I think that, you know, that's why I've been writing about what I've been writing about is is because this is the world that I'm enmeshed in now. Um, but um, yeah, I would like to at least once, you know. I you know, I'd like to do 10, 12 books overall. So I got time. Yeah, I think that's definitely doable. I think that you know, it's funny how I asked you that question about going back, and then I've talked to you quite a bit about uh something I want to do leaving the South and leaving Virginia. And we've talked about my, uh, my possible LA novel. So I think that's interesting as writers, how we continuously, hopefully we're continuously trying to push ourselves, trying to be better, trying to be better than our last book, but also artistically 
something you said to me in a, in a conversation. I hope you don't mind me sharing it, but mm-hmm. you said, you know, in 15 years, I want to walk in a bookstore and see my books and, and be proud of the stories that I told. You know, I, I want stories that last and I, I definitely feel the same way. And I definitely think everybody knows it's going to be a book that people talk about for a really long time. It is a phenomenal piece of work. Um, it's an incredible sort of tour de force. Like I said, it's a modern day Chinatown. You know, it's told through a LA confidential prism and distilled through our, our modern influencer, social media, fast paced life. And, uh, I couldn't be prouder of you as a fellow writer because I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal work of art. Um, I, anybody that's listening, you can get it uh, at Barnes and Noble. You can order it. It's a uh, part of Barnes and Noble's uh, Mystery of the Month uh, book club, and uh, I think, man, it's just been awesome talking to you. I mean, uh, I I think I don't have to say this. I think you already know it, and even though it embarrasses you, I I think you're one of the finest writers working today. Um, your work inspires me to make my work better and so I, I have to say thank you for that so well thank you for that and also i feel the same way and I, I i like that we have the friendliest competition because we're in such different lanes it doesn't feel like competition but i, I but yeah i appreciate it look uh, I, I all those kind words and i'll say the, the chance that somebody on this zoom doesn't have all the sinners bleed is probably non-zero but if there's somebody out there. I, you know, you compare it sometimes to True Detective, but you're a better writer than Nick Pizzolatto is. So I think you, you know, you got we got to find a different way to describe it. But look, thank you so much, and thanks to Barnes and Noble. I deeply appreciate being the thriller of the month. It's very cool, uh, and and thanks to everyone. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Barnes and Noble, for having us. If you don't have everybody knows, go out and get it. Pick it up. Best book, best crime novel of the year. Thank you guys. Y'all take care. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.